It's my pleasure to welcome you to a special edition podcast of the Clark Howard Show. You know, our mission is to serve you with advice and information that empowers you so you can take more control of your financial future. What does that mean? We get a lot of questions concerning people's wallets, and some of them get very, very, very heavily investment-oriented. And I'll answer general investment questions, but it's not drilled down deep investment advice. So we're doing something special today. We have with me a friend of mine, Wes Moss, who is host of the Retire Sooner podcast, where you answer people's deep dive investment questions. And you are a fiduciary, which means nobody can con Nobody is being conned by you because somebody else is slipping money in your pocket to say or do, and you're a fee-only planner, Mm -hmm. and I thought it'd be great to pose questions to you, Wes, for our podcast listeners that get deeper into investing. And I want to start with something that there was a lot of buzz about. And by the way, very happy to be happy to be here. And you you really got me started in the radio podcast business. So it's cool to be here. You were what did twenty years ago? Twenty almost twenty years ago, you were the guy that I was listening to on the radio and thinking, wow, I would, that would be a cool thing to do. I'd love to seriously. Do that. Yeah, man. I never knew that. If I mean, everybody, first of all, everybody knows you, but I, no, and I never, and I never <laughs> thought that I would be able to, to get a chance to do it. And then went into the podcast world. So you've been very helpful and I appreciate that. So thanks, man. Absolutely. So, um, let's talk Warren Buffett, mm. who is considered by many people, especially those over 40, to being like the greatest investment mind ever. And he publishes a letter once each year and does a commentary about how he feels about investing. And he's sitting with more cash than he's ever had. And he says, because everything's overvalued right now. Right. And so then a lot of financial outlets have been parroting that the market is way overvalued. And I just read a story last week in the Wall Street Journal about what do you do since the market is overvalued and all that. So as people wonder about that, what do you say to them about this thing of, well, does it mean I should sell everything and run the sidelines? Or do I not put more money in? Or what do I do? Because it's so overvalued. So one of the secrets that doesn't get talked about a whole lot when it comes to Warren Buffett, and you look at his rates of return over time, he's compounded at an inc- about double the S&P 500, which is amazing. Right. And his rate of return over time is really hard. It's almost unmatched. Right. But perhaps the biggest secret of that, and, and really in the early days when Berkshire was a really small entity, he, he admittedly will say, back when we were really little... I could buy a couple of stocks, and if I did well, it really moved the meter. Today, they're a multi-hundred billion dollar company. So he, even he will say it's really hard to move the meter now at at, at Berkshire Hathaway. And that he's he's admitted in, in this latest letter that he will be closer to the overall market returns, more likely, for the foreseeable future. But what doesn't get talked about a lot is just the sheer fact that he has essentially three quarters of a century doing the same thing. So he's not just a marathon runner, he's an ultra marathon runner. And one thing that he is he doesn't do, even though we talk about 150 billion in cash, that's actually not even all that much relative to the overall size of Berkshire Hathaway. So he didn't get here to where he is after over 75 years of investing by getting in and out of the market. And he, will, he, would, he would tell us that. And to this question, what he's saying is, sure, the, the market's done really well. The, the, yes, you could say it's a little bit overvalued, but a lot of that overvaluation is because of a few big technology companies that rule the day. If you take out, let's call a handful of technology companies and look at the rest of the market, so take out 10 companies of the S&P 500, look at the other 490, they're, they're trading in their price relative to what they're earning at a, pretty, at a relatively historical normal level. So if, if we were to really follow what Warren Buffett does action-wise, not what he's saying, 
he's not someone that has gotten in and out of the market because he thinks it's a little bit overvalued. He stayed the course. And yes, he always has some cash. But remember, relative to the size of Berkshire, it, it's not as though he's gone to cash and is worried that the market is overvalued. He hasn't gotten out. So his secret is long term staying the course, which I think is the takeaway for investors here today. Well, let's take some questions for you, Wes. And first, we have Oscar from California, 47 years old, teacher in Los Angeles, started investing later in retirement, just paid off his house of 47. Congratulations. That's all. I love the Own your home that. free and clear, has zero debt, not a penny of debt, maxes out his 403B, maxes out his Roth IRA. Employer offers a 457B and Roth 457B in addition. Can he legally contribute to the 403B, Roth IRA, 457B, Roth 457B, <laughs> all at the same time? So he, this is the cool thing. Not many people have the 403B and the 457. So the cool thing about, and it's a pretty rare situation that he's in, but when you when you're in that situation, you can max out two of you can max out two of them. So you can do the twenty two thousand five hundred times two. So it's really he could save forty five thousand dollars a year and do the four o three b, and he can do the four fifty seven. Can he, but I don't I don't think he can also do the four fifty seven Roth. He he hits a limit there, and his total limit is forty five thousand dollars. Now, if those listening that are sixty. Or, or I'm sorry, 50, 50. and older, they, the, the combined, because you, you get this catch-up provision at 50 plus, now it goes to 30 each, 30 times two would be 60. So it's an even higher limit if what, what in a couple of years for Oscar. And the thing for Oscar, Oscar, for you, this is exactly what catch-up is about. Because yeah. you started later in life saving, you're going to turn 50 in uh, three years, and then you're going to be able to give an additional booster shot to your retirement, which is your plan anyway. So we got Ryan in Florida. And so Ryan's selling current home and moving into a rental in a new state. And they're going to take that time living in the rental to look for a new home. He's moving fr from Florida. Moving out of Florida. There's a big move right now that doesn't get reported a lot of middle income house owners leaving the state of Florida, not necessarily wanting to leave the state of Florida, but the cost of homeowners insurance so high. is forcing them out. Yeah. And he's going to get 500 grand from the sale of the home. And so how would you suggest handling that money? He says investing the money for up to one year to use towards the new home. So it's if it's really a time horizon question, meaning that one of the most important things, Clark, as you know, when you're when you're investing money, you've got to understand when you're going to be able to use it. And if it's a if it's for retirement over the next ten and twenty and thirty years, then you can invest it in the stock market and you can withstand the gyrations of the market because we can go down 10, 20, 30, 40 percent in any given year at any time. And that's important because if you know you have a, a destination for this money or a goal and you have a time specifically, let's call it a year, then you just don't want to risk it. You don't want to risk the volatility in, in the stock market really at all. And the, the good news though here is that interest rates are high. Now that's a bad news for homeowners because mortgage rates are high. It's, a good, it's good news for savers. So because rates are at 5%, you can find a money market for 5% or CDs at 5%. And I would be looking for, I actually look at, tre I like treasury money markets. There's a, there's a, there are hundreds or thousands of different kinds of money market mutual funds. I like the treasury ones right now, just because it's, there's, there's no funny business outside of government paper or government bonds some money markets can get a little cute and, and buy other assets outside of government bonds or treasuries, but the yields are good enough. And if you can find five or a little over 5% in a good old fashioned treasury money market fund, totally liquid, I think that's a really good place to, to stash that money away. Uh, you know, you took the words right out of my mouth because I was worried about you, Ryan, having 500000 in a bank or credit union savings account because you're only insured to 250 the treasuries that's better than uh, 
a bank insured savings account or a credit union insured savings account because it's a direct obligation exactly of the if, u.s if tre- treasury. If treasuries don't work then i don't know if the fdic works and, right right so if treasuries <laughs> can't pay off we got much bigger yeah. problems Agreed, don't we Clark. all right so we have lee now in georgia uh happy birthday lee lee turns 65 in just a few weeks and he wants to retire and lee wants to take money out of his 401k plan for two years and start collecting social security at full retirement age of 67. Is it a good idea to delay taking social security using some of his 401k plan? He's got 300,000 in it. He'll be withdrawing about 30,000 a year for two years to avoid taking social security before full retirement age. He'll also be working full-time at his church. Wait a minute. So he's going to be working full-time? Till 65. And so he needs that extra 30 to, to bridge the gap until he at 67. Right. To take his Mac, well, his full, his, his FRA, his full retirement age. I, I think I like that. So if you were to do, think about the math here, Lee, it's 30,000 on 300,000 is 10% a year. We know that, a safe withdrawal rate is in the 4% range. Call it, I call it 4% plus, 4, 4.5% range. And if you do that histo- over time, super, really, really high probability that you can keep up with inflation and really not ever worry about running out in the long run, 20, right. 30, 40 years. So it, we want to get to that withdrawal rate point as soon as we can. But this happens all the time where someone's waiting a little bit for Social Security. We know we get a giant bump every year we wait. Eight percent, is a, that what it is? Right. It's a seven to eight percent bump. In, in the, and then that's for life. And that's for life. And if Lee's married, if he has a higher Social Security payment and something happens to him than, than his spouse, then, then she may be able to inherit that at a higher level. So that's important to maxim, to not necessarily wait all the way to 70 for some people, but allowing Social Security to grow is really important. It sounds like that's what Lee's doing and only doing 10% a year for only two years. Yes, it's way it's beyond the 4% rule, but it sounds like once social kicks in, he'll be able to go easily to that 4% rule or maybe closer to that. And I think that's a good strategy. So sure, I think 10% a year, it's a lot, but as long as he's getting back to that 4% plus range in withdrawals once he stops working, that should last him for the longevity of his retirement. And my obsession with age 70 would be a bridge too far in this case. Because that would be three additional years of pulling 30000 a year each year. I mean, he'd end up cutting his total amount he saved in half over five years. Right. If, if he gets down to, let's call it 150000 it feels that cushion in retirement. And we don't, maybe he has some other non IRA money, but that cushion starts to get really too small to last you a lifetime. Okay, so yeah, you always hear me uh, obsessed with waiting to take Social Security till age 70. And I love that not, too, yeah. Not appropriate in your case. And I just said that. I never say that. What, not appropriate? Not appropriate. In <laughs> your case, your idea of waiting the two years till 67 makes perfect sense. Now, coming up, we're going to talk about something that as a fee-only financial advisor you're asked a lot. Individual stocks, funds, ETFs, index funds, we're going to address that straight ahead. And this is a special Clark Howard podcast with my friend Wes Moss, who is a brainiac about investing. And it's great to have you here on this special edition. So Wes, uh, as I tease to This whole debate about owning individual stocks or owning funds, index funds, ETFs, because I I look at funds, index funds, ETFs as like one corner and individual stocks, the other corner. What are you recommending as a general rule over the arc of your career? And what are you recommending right now? Is it either or? Where are you on this? Are you a politician? Are you going to say, well, it can be both? Or <laughs> are you rock solid one way or the other? Because, you know, I have my obsession 
with index funds. I do too. To, to the, so first of all, the, the great thing, Clark, is as I know you've talked about many times over the years, is that index funds are super low cost, ultra, ultra low. So you almost have no friction with cost. And I think that's hugely important. So that's number one. Number two, there's this concept. There, there's a book that I've, I've been talking about recently. It's a, it's a guy named Morgan Housel who wrote about the psychology of money. And one of the, one of the interesting points he makes about investing is something called tail risk, meaning that there are, there are events that happen over time that really can carry the day. So if you look at the Russell 3000, which is a, a giant index of, call it large and small cap companies, if you look at over the last 20 years or 25 years or 30 years, you'll see that that index has done well. It's call it 10, 11, 12% a year, which is wonderful. Remember, our money dub doubles every 10 years at 7%. It, it doubles every 7.2 years at 10%. So that's a great return. But only 7% of the companies in the Russell are what drove all the performance. And it's so hard. Think about trying to find that, that seven needle out in of 3,000. It's, it's 7%, but still needle yeah. in a haystack. Yeah. So that, oh, so 20. So it's still not a whole lot of companies. Yeah. Right. Got it. And, and that's the same 210 thing. 210 companies out of 3,000. Out of 3,000. And the S&P 500, we've seen over the last couple of years, it's only been five or six companies that have driven most of the returns. So you, you, it's hard to ever know exactly what they're going to be. So you get this concept of tail risk. You usually hear, well, it's a one in a thousand event that's bad, but it's really there's tail risk to the upside. So it's a couple of companies that really do well that can carry the day. And that's why if, I'm, if I were to be put in a box and say, you have to pick one, I think we're better off on really broad ETFs that have... 50, 100, 500, 1,000 companies in them so that we have the opportunity to catch the tail risk that's to the good side. So not that I don't own some individual stocks. I do. And I've seen that work really well. As, but, but if I had to pick one, a broadly diversified list of ETFs or, or conglomerate of ETFs that are, that are broad-based, I think that's most people's best bet. All right, so I've had two people ask me recently, so I'm going to ask a okay. follow-up before we go to questions people have posed. ETFs or index funds? If you, if you, it's funny, even John Bogle, the founder of Vanguard, had, a, had an issue. He hates he ETFs. He hates, hates ETFs because well, they... We're talking about a deceased man hates, <laughs> hated. The, so the reason I think that, so they, they, they functionally should be totally the same. Right. An index fund is a mutual fund, and you can only buy it or sell it once a day. So it prevents you from any sort of shenanigans around day trading. And the, and the, the potential problem around ETFs is that they trade just like stocks. They're still just baskets of companies. It could be 20 companies. It could be 100. It could be 1,000. But they do trade second by second, and there's this temptation to trade them at any given time. And I think that's why a pure index mutual fund person doesn't like ETFs. I think they're totally fine. I really like using ETFs. They're, uh, they give you a little bit more flexibility if you want to buy something or liquidate something at any given part of the day. So I think they both serve the really good purpose of broad diversification. We get our tail risk to the upside, which we want. We mitigate our single stock risk, which we, we certainly know about. But I'm I'm complete. If I had to choose another, if you're if, if I'm not being a politician here, Clark, and give you an answer, I would still choose ETFs today, just because of the 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 the, the massive uh, list of what we can choose from. All right, Are you ready for some questions? Okay, I'm not trying to get. I'm I'm giving you solid answers here. I don't. I'm not going to waffle. No wishy washy. Today. No wishy washy today. Yeah, we're we're not a politician today. All right. You could be if you want to be. Do you want to be a I did. That'd be the worst job in the, the history of the universe. So uh, we have a question from the great state of Ohio, if we go with the whole okay. political thing. Okay. Nick <laughs> is with us now with his question. You often recommend choosing a target date fund for a retirement portfolio. I feel that might not be the right choice for everyone because I expect to have a government pension, real estate, social security, and my thrift savings plan in retirement. And I don't expect to be, de expect to be dependent on my TSP for monthly expenses. 
Because of this, I prefer to select a higher risk asset mix in order to maximize gains to pass on my retirement savings as an inheritance to my loved ones. In this case, would a higher risk asset mix make more sense? Thanks, Nick. So you get to answer Nick instead of me. Okay. The the, the so target date funds I think are were a great innovation when it, and a good innovation within investing. It automatically helped people get diversification and asset allocation, and then get more conservative as they get older. They migrate towards fixed income bonds that are uh, should be a lot safer and provide more stability. But this is a really again. But there's nuances to that. And anytime somebody has a pension, I look at that pension amount, and even and you can look at Social Security the, uh, uh, in the same way too. It is extraordinarily secure just like a bond would be. So if he's got $5,000 a month coming in in guaranteed income, pension, social security, then that's worth an enormous amount in if you were to translate that to bonds. So he's I think he's right in thinking I don't need to have a target date fund that's the year 2030 which is going to get to 30 or 40% or 50% in bonds, depending on, on what target date fund you're looking at, because they're all different. That's the other thing about target date funds. T. Rowe Price has a different target date fund than Vanguard, et cetera. So I like the idea of him recognizing that he already has lots of conservative investments because of the pensions. And that sure, if, he, if his goal, and investing is really all about identifying a goal and then investing towards it, yeah, if he wants to maximize his savings, his retirement assets for his heirs and his legacy, then I think he's super smart to maybe not do a target date fund and look at something that is much more stock-based and doesn't automatically get more conservative as he gets older. So that brings up an annex question that you what's, didn't what's ask. A, what's an that, annex question? Just to, that means uh, like a bonus question. Okay, bonus. Bonus, bonus round. round. Okay. So... Nick didn't ask it, so I'm going to ask it. So if his real goal for his thrift savings plan is TSP, mm -hmm. if you're not familiar with what that means, he's a federal worker, and it's a better version of a 401k than the rest of us have as normal earthlings, shouldn't he be putting money in the Roth TSP because that's a good asset to inherit, where the traditional TSP is as bad, ugly as a traditional IRA for his family members to inherit. So again, another really, this is planning gets very individualized here. And to some extent, if he's doing a Roth version of the TSP, then he's to some extent paying a little bit of taxes today so that he saves taxes for his kids. For his kids. Now, uh, some, a lot of our, your listeners might say, look, I, I want to just, I, I need to take care of my own retirement and I, I don't need to pay the taxes today for my kids tomorrow. They're going to have plenty of money no matter what. But if he's already in great shape and he knows he's never going to spend it, then I see families do this all the time. Hey, I, I'll pay the taxes today. The Roth is a, a, a wonderful vehicle to leave to someone. And so I would say, yeah, if, if that is truly his goal, and he's okay to pay those taxes, then all day long, the Roth version is awesome. And I remember, and, and, and let me just see, if this, is this right, Clark? It's this, it's CSIFG. Do you know what I'm saying there? CSIFG. Is that the particular fund you want him in in the, no, in the I, TSP? Wait, 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 that's how I remember TSP. It's just these simple options, right? It's right. The, 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 the C is the large cap fund or the kind of like the S&P 500. I always remember CSI as the, as the crime show. Uh, the CSI, uh, the common the C is the large cap, S is small cap, I international, and then FG fixed income and government, and that's the that's the simplicity of that is beautiful. Right. Although uh, I don't know if you know, they've gummed up the works with the TSP recently, and now there's a lot of much higher cost, more complicated options you can do, which I hate. But are are, are they really? Aren't they the options of just? Uh, juggling those five with the no, life you can cycle? do all kinds of crazy stuff now oh you can okay hate it hate it hate it hate it keep it simple keep it simple so sari in utah has a question for you and it's sri or sri i'm sorry if i pronounced your name wrong uh recently it's talking about me recently i talked about buying cds from investment houses mm -hmm. like vanguard today my typical investment is in a 60 40 portfolio with bonds earning meager returns. 
is it better to move that 40% to CDs in the way I described so that they can be assured of better returns? Okay, so the, there's a couple of things here. The I think we, we've gone through a lot of years where rates were really low. And, and bonds and, were terrible. Bonds didn't pay a lot. And then even worse, because they work like a seesaw, it, the way I look at this is that when rates go up, prices go down, and rates went up a lot over the last couple of years. So not only did bonds weren't paying a whole lot, their prices also went down. So I think that right now, the investors looking in retrospect think, oh, bonds have been terrible. They're, they're awful. I should never do them. However, we are in a bond returns. There, there's a phrase within the, the bond world called yield is destiny, meaning that wherever our yields are, wherever rates are, interest rates are today, you have a pretty good probability that that's what that's similar to what you will receive year after year for the next several years. And rates are high. So if you lock in a CD, you, you have a great guarantee for that one year. Maybe it's a two year or even three. But as you could, as we, as we, as we see, CD rates get lower as we go out right now. So I, I actually think for longer term investment money, bonds are probably better today than they've been in a lot of years as the prospect for making money on them over the next, let's call it many years. And they're a great ballast. And I think that because rates are back to a more quote normal level, they will come back to that counterbalancing property that they've had for a lot of years. When stocks don't do well, we, we can depend more on our, on our fixed income or the bond side. So I still like, I actually would rather if you're an investor, have that bond side as opposed to just CDs. And am I right that, Bonds have had the worst cycle, you know, the 60-40 uh, balance funds. The, the bond part had the worst cycle it's ever had. Essentially, yes. Yeah. Yes. So the bad news you already suffered from. <laughs> right. And now we're at a point where looking back looks bad. And if you bail, you're missing the looking forward being good. Right. If I, I think if somebody jumps out of the bond market today, it's a little bit like jumping out of the stock market at the bottom. Wes, thank you so much. I've loved yeah. doing this today. And you have done so much study on what leads to success in retirement. Hit me with some highlights of the things that our listeners should know as they're thinking about their future, as they're trying to plan for it, as they may be anxious about what retirement is going to be. What have you learned over the years? I think that retire. I think that retirement. So first of all, to to me, ha having financial security, having money, g gives us a sense of freedom, and w and then every human wants that. Number one. Number two. One of the biggest topic we worry about, besides our health and our family, is about money, and so we're always going to be worried about that. And I think that we all have to have a set of just simple fundamental checkpoints that we know we need to get to, and if we get to them we're in pretty good shape and we can lower our worry. That, that's been my goal on the Retire Sooner podcast for, for many years. And, and, the, and the research studies I've done really are comparing the habits of happy versus unhappy retirees. And happy may be the wrong word. Maybe that group, even though they're reportedly happy, over the years, I, I think that what I've also learned about that group is they have just a worry. So I'm, I'm always trying to help folks get to the, what are those financial checkpoints? And there's, there's several of them. And then I think there's also a really important handful of lifestyle checkpoints. And I won't go into all of them today, but just a couple of things on the financial side. Uh, one, we, we talked about this in the show today. One is to have your mortgage pay off with insight. It's tough to do it. It's, a, it's the biggest bill we have. But if we can get rid of our mortgage, retirees are four times more likely to be in the happy retiree camp versus unhappy. So getting rid of mortgage, huge, multiple streams of income. So that could be social security for me, social for my spouse, pension, and then my retirement income that comes from my investments. And happy retirees have statistically more and different, not necessarily much more money, but different income streams, again, lowers their financial worry. There's also some financial checkpoints to get to. And I know that th this is a number that can be debated till the end of time, but at least from a research perspective, what I've seen is that we want to, the, the median 
happy retiree retirement balance that I found, the median number, not the, not the mean, is about 700,000. The, the, so that's a, that, that gives you an awful lot of fire or horsepower to generate more income on top of Social Security. I know some okay, people- So question, I'm sorry yeah, to interrupt you on yeah. this. I saw an article recently that when consumers were asked, they thought they had to have north of $5 million right. to be happy in retirement. Your empirical research found definitively that the number is around 700,000. Right. So originally, when I, I first did my research, let's call it w over 10 years ago, it was 500,000. Uh, updated for the massive inflation that we've all lived through, particularly the last couple of years, it's, it's 700,000. So I think the $5, the $5 million number is crazy talk. I, I've worked with so many families over the year. They're, they're ultra happy retirees. They, they're not at $5 million. So that, that is, that's the other part of this. And then maybe bringing back to another th thought around, and I know that you've got this, you've always had a really positive outlook on the world. Some people will say Pollyanna. I, I say you're just a, you're, you're realist about eventually things work out in America and eventually things get better, even though we know we have lots of potholes and sinkholes along the way. But Happy retirees understand that, and I and I, I think of them as tomorrow investors. They're not worried about today or this week or the what's happening in in the latest economic headline. And if we can teach ourselves to be longer term optimists, that doesn't necessarily mean that everything's great all the time. But think about tomorrow, meaning five years, ten years, twenty years down the line then I, that goes a long way, A, in growing our money over time, giving us the patience to be able to do that, and then reducing our worries along the way. And, and, and those are some of the financial things that I see happy retirees, they, they, they own that. They, they own that list. And uh, future time, we'll talk about BMWs versus... Chevrolets or Hondas? So, no, the, the BMW is the terrible luxury car for happy retirees. The Lexus is the number one luxury car. Got it. So you found the unhappiest retirees drive BMW. No, the number one luxury car for the unhappy retiree group, BMW. And the happiest retiree group, luxury car. Number one luxury car, the Lexus. Okay, I love that. Your podcast again? It, retire Sooner. It's just the Retire Sooner podcast with Wes Moss, and uh, we've been doing it for a couple of several years now, and uh, it's a lot of fun. Awesome. Thank you, Wes. Thanks, this was man. fun. I hope you enjoyed it. It's a curveball. We like to throw curveballs every once in a while, and we get these questions that are so specific about investing that really are too specific for me having you here with your knowledge your experience and your training is great and i appreciate you so much thanks clark and i hope you have a great day remembering what we're about save more spend less and avoid getting ripped off and tomorrow clark stinks comes your way